Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. In today's lectures, I'd like to take a little foray into a very exciting sub-area of evolutionary biology, and that's the intersection between evolutionary biology and the study of animal behavior. In this first lecture, we'll look at optimality and adaptive feeding behavior. But first, let's talk a little bit more broadly about animal behavior. Animal behavior is a very, very active research area, and particularly studying animal behavior in an evolutionary context. You can study animal behavior from many different approaches. You can look at hormonal basis for animal behavior. You can look at neural basis for animal behavior. But what we want to look at now, rather than proximate causes, we want to look at the ultimate reasons for why animals behave the way that they do. Now, behavior, as I mentioned, integrates with these many different aspects of biology such as physiology or hormones and nerves, genetics, ecology, and fundamentally evolution. Now some areas where animal, where I'm sorry, where evolutionary thinking is applied to the study of animal behavior is in the context of survival or avoiding predation. Obviously very important for passing on your genes is that you don't get killed early. Uh, feeding or foraging behavior, it's obvious this is what's happening at the other end of this. <laughs> Choosing where to live, communicating, reproductive behavior, sexual selection. This one we'll talk about in a different context much later on, but not here in these videos. Uh, parental care and social behavior. So we'll dabble into a couple of these in, uh, in the videos that you have here. The ones in this particular video that we'll talk about are looking at optimality theory, or specifically how you can get the maximal effect for the minimal cost, which is what we would infer that natural selection would, would push uh, species to ultimately be able to do. And we'll look at apply, applying optimality theory to the study of feeding behavior and why feeding behavior is often adaptive. Now, as you know, the evidence for natural selection abounds across species. So let's look at the example of the Eastern, I'm sorry, the Eurasian oyster catcher. Now, this species feeds on mussels, so not mussels like this, but mussels like the, the small clams that you have over here. Now, there is an optimal size of muscle for this bird to pursue. If a muscle is too small, they're not going to get enough nourishment. It's not worth it for them to spend the energy to open something that's going to give them almost no energy. If it's too large, it becomes extremely hard to open, at which point they'll expend tons of energy and may never get any nutrients out of it as well. So there should be some optimal intermediate size muscle that these oyster catchers would be selecting. And that would be, in principle, selected by natural selection. Now, people ran a bunch of models, and they suggested that oyster catchers should pick 50 millimeter size mussel. That was the prediction. Um, from these initial models, they looked for this, and in fact, there was not a good fit of the models to the data. That in fact, uh, these oyster catchers were picking smaller mussels. So they refined the mussels, and they predicted with this refinement that the oyster catchers should pick 30 to 45 millimeter mussels because the larger ones are covered with barnacles and that may, may, may make them harder to open. Now, in fact, the birds do prefer 30 to 45 millimeter mussels, so with this revision of the model, the model fits the data. Hmm, this should be causing you a little bit of concern when somebody just manipulates a model to make it fit the data, right? Well, there is this view that selection is everywhere, right? That structures and behaviors are optimally designed by natural selection for their function. And whenever we see something is not optimal, we infer a trade-off or some sort of compromise among competing demands. Now, this is a little bit of a risky thing because basically you're making it so every possible observation will eventually fit your model. Now, Gould and Lewinton uh, criticized this and referred to this as the adaptationist program. They suggested that many researchers were doing this. They were interpreting data by assuming the near omnipotence of natural selection in forging organic design and fashioning the best among possible worlds. Now, this is often referred to as adaptive storytelling by people who don't like it. That, you know, we, we see something and we just make up an adaptive story until it seems to fit and then say, oh, that must have been it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> That's not good science, and unfortunately, this kind of thing has happened for a very long time. Overinterpretation goes back over 100 years. In fact, if you look back before 1909, Spencer asked Galton to look at his fingerprints. Galton said he didn't know the functions of these patterns, 
Um, and many people had studied this, you know, dissecting the fingers of unborn children, trying to study their prints, things like that. Now, Spencer suggested, well, the ridges obviously, there's an important word here, obviously, function to protect the sweat glands in the valleys. Sounds like that makes sense. The problem is the glands are actually in the ridges themselves, so actually it doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> now, science is, uh, has been referred to by Thomas Henry Huxley as the organized common sense where many a beautiful theory was killed by an ugly fact. In fact, despite the use of optimality theory, and optimality theory is actually a good thing when applied properly, there are many traits and behaviors out there that are not perfectly adapted. Now, there are many reasons why traits or behaviors may not be perfectly adapted, as we see them now in the wild. Well, one possibility is that there's been a failure for the appropriate mutations to occur. That if the mutation for making it just that much better never happened, then it's stuck where it is, right? You could have single genes that cause multiple phenotypic effects. This is referred to as pleiotropy where, for example, an allele may be good for one trait, but bad for a different trait, such that there is this sort of trade-off going on. There is a possibility that ultimately the trait will be perfectly adapted, but there hasn't been sufficient time for selection to operate, or the environment keeps changing, and, you know, it's, and it's this moving target that you know, makes it very hard for a trait to be optimally adapted for any particular. There are many, many other reasons. This is just a subset of those. But very importantly, optimality predictions should be tested and judged, not just presumed. Now, optimality, when I use this term, is the assumption that by knowing exactly how natural selection is acting on this trait, we should be able to predict exactly what the trait should look like. Now, let me give you an example where uh, there was some misunderstanding, again, in terms of uh, understanding a trait. This is the example of the oxpecker. So this is, a, this is a bird that you often see on top of an ox, for example. Um, they live on large mammals. They thought to feed somewhat on ticks at least, and the dogma that was repeated for many, many years is it was mutually beneficial for the, for the oxpecker bird and the ox to, to be associated because the bird was picking off these ticks that are bad for the animal, and so the, animal just, the, the, mammal, the mammal just leaves them there. Unfortunately, there were no good tests of this until around 2000. And what happened then is people started exploring whether the cattle that had oxpeckers had more or less ticks than cattle without oxpeckers. Now, if the oxpeckers are picking off the ticks, then you would assume the cattle that have the oxpecker bird should have fewer ticks, right? Well, in fact, tests showed there was no significant reduction in tick load when you had oxpeckers. So they, they tested this multiple times, and there was no significant reduction. And in fact, further tests showed that these oxpeckers were actually enlarging open wounds and drinking the blood from the ox. That's not good. That's not mutualistic at all. <laughs> That's something very much to the benefit of the bird, but to the detriment of the large mammal. Now, the question you might want to ask is, so why do the cattle tolerate these birds hanging on them? They're opening their wounds. Well, I asked my class this back in 2012, and here's a set of some other responses. On the negative side, somebody suggested that the hosts don't actually tolerate the oxpeckers, but they just are not able to get them off. That is a possibility. Uh, there's a neutral side that maybe, you know, that's not actually that big a deal to the cattle. So it's kind of like when a fly is buzzing in my face and after a while I just let it pester me because it won't go away. This suggests that maybe the oxpecker's effect on the cattle is fairly small, even though they're getting uh, potentially nutrients themselves. There's the mutual advantage side that somehow they're strengthening the cattle's immunity, <coughs> possibly by increasing antibodies to fight antigens. That would definitely be an adaptationist explanation. And there are some crazy out there explanations people suggested, like maybe they like the company or the oxpeckers generate many force fields. That's probably not it. <coughs> when we look at the research results for why this was the case, so looking at the research results for why the hosts tolerate these, it turns out, in fact, that some of these hosts try to get them off, but are unable to do so, just like the one student had suggested in the previous slide that with, in the case of rhinos, they tried quite hard, but were only able to get them off half the time when they were at wounds. So this figure down here shows uh, attempts to remove the oxpecker from one at wounds, so successful versus unsuccessful. You know, it's about, only about half of them were successful at getting them off the wounds. In contrast, when they're on the ears, they're able to flick them off fairly easily, or at other places on their body, they're able to flick them off easily. So... It is not a mutualistic thing as was previously assumed, even though that was the adaptationist explanation. So let's look at applying optimality theory to studying adaptive 
uh, feeding behavior, but let's try to be careful not to be overly adaptation. So what considerations go into optimal feeding? Well, if you want to feed, and again, you want to do it as efficiently as possible, what you want to do is you want to maximize energy while minimizing consumption of energy and time, right? So high energy per low unit of time is the best. So on the plus side, you're getting calories from food. That's your energy. On the minus side, you're expending energy to get the food. So energy may be involved in searching, handling, eating, or digesting. And on the minus, there's also time involved in getting food, which also involves, of course, burning more energy, but it's time involved in searching, handling, and digesting. So if we were to put together a very simple formula for optimal foraging, we want to maximize this quantity here. We want to maximize calories obtained from food minus calories expended getting food divided by time to get and eat. Okay, so again, we want the prey with the highest caloric content we want to spend the minimal energy and time getting this prey. So this is, this is the idea behind it. So let's look at this in the context of whelk eating crows. It's another set of birds eating shelled animals. <laughs> uh, in this case, these are crows in British Columbia that pick up whelks on average about four centimeters long, rarely less than that. They fly up into the air with these, with these uh, whelks and they drop them. Now they fly almost exactly five meters and then drop them to try to shatter the shell and get the snail meat outside. Now, sometimes it takes a couple of flights to do it. Is this adaptive? Well, there's a couple of different things these could do, right? They could pick different size whelks. They could fly different heights. They could fly more times. So let's look and see how this might be adaptive. Let's break it up into parameters. First, let's look at the height of drop. Obviously, it takes energy to fly high, so you want to minimize the energy you're taking for flying high. But you want a high probability that the shell will break. You don't want to have to fly 40 times you want to fly like once or twice and be able to break it. So people looked at this in the context of the underlying physics, and it turns out, in fact, five, high, five meters height is optimal for uh, the size for that size shell to shatter. So you can look here on the x-axis, uh, the height in meters. So this is from zero to 15 feet, or 15 meters to, uh, in the air. On the y-axis is number of drops required to break the whelk shell. And you note, when you're at five meters, you're, you're pretty much at a level point there where it doesn't seem like if you go much higher, you have a much higher probability of breaking the whelk shell. So that's, that's at a very uh, optimal point. There's a very little increase in probability of shell breaking if you go any higher. So that does seem to be adaptive. What about the size of whelk? Couldn't they have picked maybe a smaller whelk? You know, why didn't they pick the smaller whelk? Well, they experimentally tried three sizes. Uh, in this case, the, the one they picked is, is referred to as large. These are the four centimeter whelks. And they found that the whelk would need to, I'm sorry, the bird, not the whelk, the bird would need to fly higher and or drop more times to break the smaller shell. So again, on the x-axis here, we show the height of drop. On the y-axis, we, we show the number of drops needed per whelk. So for the large one, again, here's, this is what they, this is what they ended up choosing. If they chose a smaller whelk, you know, a medium-sized one, they would have to drop it, you know, twice that many times, and even more if they chose a very small whelk. So again, it seems like they did choose adaptive. Now, a question that a lot of people like to ask is, do we see optimal feeding in humans? Hmm. Well, there is the case of spices, and spices have been suggested as a place where humans may actually have some sort of optimal now, the caloric content in them is typically very low. So why do we like spicy food? Why do you like garlic? Maybe you don't like garlic. Um, well, one possibility is it's just random or some correlated response to, t uh, to smell or taste that's unrelated to the actual uh, garlic itself. The other possibility is that there's an antimicrobial property associated with some of the spices we use. In fact, many spices are known to have very strong antimicrobial properties. Uh, cinnamon, cloves, and mustard have strong antimicrobial uh, effectiveness. Some of the others have medium antimicrobial effectiveness, like allspice, cumin, oregano, etc. And some inhibit very specific things, like garlic, for example, as I mentioned, inhibits salmonella, E. coli, staph, bacillus. Cloves inhibit aspergillus, and things like that. So let me ask you to generate a prediction in, in, in video quiz here. <clears throat> if spices are used because they're antimicrobial, and given what you might guess about what countries have particular environments that are warm or moist and thus more likely to have a lot of microbes, if you surveyed the following countries, India, Hungary, and Norway, which would you expect to use the most spices in their cuisine, and specifically the most spices with antimicrobial properties? 
Well, that was a pretty easy question, I think. The expectation is that more antimicrobials are needed in environments that will favor the growth of microbes. So places where it's warm and moist will favor the growth of microbes. So if we look at these three countries, India, Hungary, and Norway, it's a no-brainer that the wettest place and the hottest place is India. So this is a place where more antimicrobials would be needed. Hungary is kind of intermediate, and Norway really is not particularly wet, and, well, it's somewhat wet, but very much not hot overall. If we look at the spices used, what we see here is, you know, this is a list of spices on the x-axis, on y-axis percent of recipes that have any of those spices. Tons of spices are used in India, somewhat in Hungary, and not so much in, Nor in Norway. Way more spices are used in India than the other two. Now, importantly, I, on, with the red arrows, I designated the use of garlic and onions in particular. Now, remember I mentioned that garlic had very specific antimicrobial properties. Let me show you the antimicrobial effectiveness of a, of a suite of spices. Here are garlic and onions. They, almost, they show almost complete inhibition of bacteria. So these are very, very effective antimicrobials. In contrast, something like celery seed is not particularly effective at all. So you see here, garlic and onion are almost completely effective. Allspice and oregano also very highly effective. Thyme, et cetera, starting to show slightly weaker inhibition of bacterial growth. So that's pretty cool. Now, in this case, we didn't really consider alternatives. So what are some of the alternative explanations that should be considered? One is that there actually are micronutrients being provided by these spices. It's a possibility. Another is that spices are used to disguise the smell of spoiled food. And the last is maybe they're just used where they grow, that maybe all these things grow in India and they don't grow in Norway or Hungary so much. Well, these have been investigated. Now, in terms of the micronutrients, that doesn't really explain the correlation with temperature. You know, why is it that people in this particular temperature need these micronutrients nutrients more than others? Um, in terms of this disguising the smell of spoiled food, that actually doesn't really make sense evolutionarily because it's not to your advantage to consume spoiled food, if anything can be to your disadvantage. And in terms of uh, being used where they grow, there is actually a very weak correlation between where they grow and where they're used, but that doesn't really explain the overall pattern. For example, pepper is one of the most widely used, and it grows in a very, very small fraction of the places. So it doesn't seem like that's explaining what's going on. Now, uh, just extrapolating from this into the importance of communication, communication is critical uh, for uh, the context of finding food for a lot of species, not just for making food uh, available to us. A classic case for this is that of honeybee dances. This, is, this was elegantly described by Nobel laureate Karl von Frisch. He showed that scout bees actually will come back to the hive and can actually give hive mates detailed information about the location of food by way of how they do their little dances. Now, I won't try to explain this dance to you, but I'll, I'll refer you to a YouTube link. This is also available online. But you should definitely watch this. It's very cool, this means of communicating uh, where food is. A question people often ask me is, how did people figure out this bee language? How did they figure out that this dancing, this particular way, sent bees off in this particular direction? Well, part of the answer was, of course, observation. You know, they would see this, and they would see it recurrently over and over again, and they, they were careful and studied it. But more recently, people have tested this using robot bees. I am not joking you. So if you want to see a video of this in action, I have a video here, and you can again have this link from the, from the main site. For more information, also check this out. There's also a comic that might be amusing to you. It's a little bit crude, I hope you don't mind, but uh, you, may you may want to take a peek at that. So we've been looking at this all in the context of adaptive feeding behavior, but as you see with the examples I'm talking about here in the context of bees, communication is sometimes very important as well. We'll come back to that in the next video. Thank you.